are back. Welcome to the podcast with a special guest today, visiting from out of town, but we're so lucky to have Lisa Belladonna arrive. Hi, Brian. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Very much known as a synth wizard, but we're going to take you all over the map today, I think, starting with a question no one's ever asked you. Okay. Fire. Richie Blackmore, Tony Iommi, who's better? Tony Iommi. Okay. <laughs> Why? <laughs> well, Double. Richie Blackmore didn't write a national acrobat. Oh, that's a good call. I'm a huge Black Sabbath fan, and when I knew you were into that stuff, I thought, we'll talk about something nobody expects. Um, we both have this reputation as people that play keyboards, specifically synthesizer music, which is deserved. Obviously, we both spent some time doing that, but I grew up playing guitar. That was my main instrument, and I know you're pretty badass yourself on a six string. <laughs> I can get around. And it makes it on your records now and then there'll be a little acoustic guitar. Yeah, occasionally. In. Yeah, years ago I did a lot of guitar work. Yeah. But, you know, my passion's always been synthesizers. And and so, you know, as soon as I could make more that be more of what I do, that's... But I love rock music and I love to listen to, especially Black Sabbath, is, you know... There's something about it and the original band, although I like... Unlike most people, I like all these different versions, even the unpopular ones. Yes. Because of that dark and doomy thing. I don't know why it resonates so much, but it really is strong. And it's, I think it's just it's honesty. You know, it's, it's the transparency of it's that part of it for me. But also, I think that they were just kind of fearless and beautifully reckless with their things that they experimented with. And... I mean, I'm a huge fan of Born Again, which is kind it's of... great. You know, I kind of get some heckle for that. I would like to remix it here. Also, there's a record called T-Y-R, Tear, oh. which is a great record with too much reverb on it. We all have those records we know and love with maybe a caveat. That's my favorite Cozy Pal album, actually, is T-Y-R. Wow, that's pretty strong because he's on a lot of good records. I, yeah, I, I have most of his stuff that he's on. Um, speaking of which, there's something in that music, we're talking about the heaviness of it and the power of it, that you also work into the synth world. Because like when you hit bass notes, they tend to growl sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Not everybody does that. They might lean cleaner or, you know, more punchy. Sure. But yours has a bit of that, you know, rock and roll power going when you hit bass notes and sweep things around. Well, I mean, everybody should put on the headphones and listen to Geezer's sound on E5150. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a hard sound to recreate on mm. really any instrument, whether it's synthesizers yeah. or bass or guitar or whatever, but it is such a huge, wide, yet right to the point sound. You know, and I love that. It's an intro piece with layered effects on the bass and I think some synth tracking going as yeah, well too. Yeah, there's some sparklies in there. They used to use it to open their shows and uh, they knew about the code, which is, I believe, California state code for insane person. That's what that is? Yeah. I never knew that. And so there's a reason Edward Van Halen called his studio 5150 and an album years later, 5150, because of that code. Yes. But it, I didn't know that part. I of don't know code. how the Sabbath people knew about the craziness code. Somebody must have gotten arrested at some point. Maybe it was Martin Birch. Yeah. One of my favorite producers, of course. Yeah. Rest easy, Martin. We yeah. miss you. Um, we were talking about this music, and I noticed today you were wearing a Nazareth shirt. Just Darren, who works here, and I were playing Razmanaz last week. Yeah. For people no. at a party who had not heard about Nazareth that much. Um, a strong group and exciting to see. I won't Brilliant dwell, band. Yeah, I won't dwell too much on the olden days music we grew up with, but if we're looking backwards to the beginning of a musician's life, what were music stores like where you grew up? Well, one of the first times I really got in trouble as a child mm -hmm. was there was a music store where I lived in Cleveland. I don't remember the name of it, but I accidentally ran away from home to go there. Wow. And I got in real big trouble. And, but where I grew up in West Virginia, where my, after my parents moved back to where their families were from, there were some really cool music stores there that had all these amazing instruments oh, and good. that's really how I got started with you know modular synthesizers and cool old amps and tape machines and all that stuff 
I recall a big limitation compared to now. When I go into a guitar center, there's 400 guitars on the wall. There might have been a dozen at the stores I would go to growing up. Yeah. And then they had catalogs, big catalogs, where you could poke and order something special, like uh, like Les Paul and Gold or something. But the store usually didn't have it to try. And keyboards was really limited. Oh, yeah. There might be a Fender Rhodes or a, maybe a synthesizer or two, in the beginning days, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I bought my first Fender Rhodes for, like, something crazy, like 45 bucks or something. Mm -hmm. So they had used stuff, too. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So this would have been in the mid 80s and then as you got along with things did you do the the hunts in like the local wanted papers still oh yeah i did where i started buying art systems and modular stuff was this guy up in fredericktown ohio who was called synth locator in the back of keyboard magazine if you go into any like late 80s early 90s keyboard magazine you'll see all caps synth locator, mm -hmm. ARP 2600, Moog Modular, EML, so on and so forth. And I called him and he said, hey, you know, I'm actually going to be doing this guitar show this coming weekend. Come up and meet me and, and we'll talk. And so I had a band at that time in the 80s called Sleeping Death, mm. which was a sort of like, what would they call proto-rock now or whatever, okay. you know, epic rock. And he had two Mellotrons. And so I wanted to come up and record the Mellotrons, cool. but I was also on a hunt for an ARP 2600. And long story short is he was really sweet and let me come up and record the Mellotrons with my Doe Coder nice. four track. And maybe a few months later, he called me. I got one for you. Oh, cool. So, and then it took me, I didn't have the money, so I came up and put a down payment down. In those days, how much would a Mellotron be worth? A Mellotron 400 with three sounds in it, right? Yeah, then I don't know. He wouldn't sell them. Oh. Okay. Yeah, those weren't for sale. So. Okay. But he found you the 2600. He did. Okay. And he had everything. He had a huge Moog 3P and a Korg PS3300, and it was insane. Amazing gear when people didn't have that stuff normally. You didn't yeah. find it in stores. These were specialty items maybe you know owned by a former person with a budget could buy it if you had a record deal he had you know interesting enough he was the only american i as far as he told me then i don't remember is it jd guitars that tony yeah, used in the 90s is, right he was a an american distributor of jd guitars too oh so you know many people know about that but uh birch guitars and jd were two other models that tony Aomi used to play yeah so yeah, he was he was a heavy cat. I don't know what happened to him. I tried to reach out to him maybe in the early 2000s and just lost touch with him. But I hope he's still around. He's a, was a huge part of. He's a huge supporter and of what you've done and where you started from. Yeah, because you know I looked up to him and I I get done with one of my albums back then. I would send him a cassette of it and you know he would just freak out and. Well, it's nice too that you're. A People user. made fun of me back then because I used all that stuff, you know? It is weird. It, it was definitely <laughs> obsolete, qualified as obsolete. Like if somebody had an older computer now, maybe 20 years old, people would laugh at you, right? It just seems cool to like a Mellotron now or a Mini Moog or something like a 2600. Yeah. Everybody gets how great those are. But at the time, it, it wasn't that way. They wanted to know how's the piano sound Yeah. and MIDI yeah. and presets, those things that weren't on those keyboards you had. When you got it at the time, how much was an ARP 2600 worth? It was just under 2000. Mm -hmm. It was really clean, and it came with the 3620 keyboard. Nice. Which I still have it. Actually, I just refurbished the keyboard fully. And then I bought another one, and um, a sequencer, and I already had an Odyssey from the studio I worked at. Mm. And then I bought a couple of I didn't realize at the time they were the same thing because you know this is these were catalog days. So I used to buy a lot of equipment from a place up in New Hampshire called Daddy's Junkie Music. Oh yeah. So I bought some tape machines from them, and I bought at the same time with one of my big projects got done. So I bought a Moog Prodigy, which I still have, a Pro Soloist, and a Pro DGX, which I thought were different synthesizers. And when they came up, I went, they're kind of the same kind thing, of but. The same thing. Yeah, that was kind of the beginning. 
You said catalog days. Explain what you mean by those. Well, why there was no pictures of the Pro DGX and the Pro Soloist, so I just thought they were the different things. You know? And it would be a, like a mailer you would get yeah. with listings and prices, <laughs> mm -hmm. but not like a menu where you could see them, of course. Yeah, because the studio that I worked for, they had like a sort of deal with them, so I would get a little bit of discount, especially if I bought two or three things at once. And Now, what's interesting about those times, and it probably goes back to the even the earliest days of synthesis, is learning how to work those things. When you get an instrument, let's say you have an Arp Odyssey, not too complicated, but it does a lot, mm. a lot. How did you figure out what to do with it? Well, first with the Odyssey, the studio that I worked with, the gentleman that um, owned it had experience with it. And I bought his Omni first, and then he had an Odyssey that he loaned me, mm. and then would show me some basic stuff. And then when I put my down payment on the 2600, he sent me back with the owner's manual. Cool. Which is, I'm sure you've read it. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing introduction to electronic music. And They did it well, mm -hmm. yeah. And so I just sort of, I had the Odyssey and I would just dream about what it would be like to have, you know, the open doors of an Odyssey you know, with, you know, modular, you know, semi-modular possibilities. Just the concepts that we now speak openly and easily about, like filtering or ring modulation or frequency, to a lot of people were alien and foreign until recent years, probably. You know, if you start with a synth, it's not really even a Juno 60 or, mm -hmm. or whatever people were using in the middle periods. Since I just have an unusual learning curve, most yeah. people never master a guitar amp with six knobs on it, but then a synthesizer has all these functions, some of which don't do anything unless you're in the right modes and stuff. Yeah, and I didn't even really have a lot of records for reference. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people would probably think, well, you know, I grew up listening to Tangerine Dream and Klaus Schulz, and not at all. You know, I was, what really brought me to synthesizers was listening to contemporary music like George Crumb and Ionis Zanakis and mm -hmm. and things like that, you know, John Adams. So it was just wanting to have this sort of orchestral control with my own personal concept of just listening to everything around me would affect me so greatly, mm -hmm. more than just musical references. So I wanted to try to experiment with that. So I really, you know, it took me a little longer than probably people now, of course, but it was a fun discovery period. It sounds like you're in a in a method too that's not emulating somebody else. I know a lot of people bought a keyboard to sound like Trent Reznor or they want to be the best sure. mode. And they end up doing that over and over again, same way a guitar player or a drummer might emulate their favorites a little too closely and not realize they're stuck in someone else's groove, you know? Yeah. So. I mean now I listen to all sorts of different music that I'm aware of, but you know, back then I was it was I didn't have a lot of references. I just wanted to. I had heard Joe Zawinul on Heavy Weather, and and I first heard it in the headphones, and, I, and it mm. blew my mind the whole spatial design of it, and the selection. You know, I mean, being those kind of caliber of jazz musicians, their whole selection process is really beautiful. It's funny you mentioned that record because I have very specific memories of listening to it on the headphones, and it. It maybe was designed to be headphone music. I'm not sure. I think sure. so. Yeah. I mean, it's just, to this day, it's really one of my most influential albums. Yeah. And even though I don't really make music that sounds like that, it's just that sort of excitement and that, you know, possibility of, you know, it's like it's like the, the sound of the album itself is the, can, is the canvas. Yeah. You know, and they're playing to that, you know. Did you have any dream instruments that you never did find? Things you looked at or dreamed about? Oh, yeah. I mean, mm. a Korg PS3300. I was a big fan of um, an album by Stomu Yamashita mm -hmm. called Go To. Mm -hmm. And that's in there with heavy weather. And so I had a big stack of modern music in recording magazines, and I had read this article of, with Stomu Yamashita about the making of that album. and. The one before it, which I think is just called Go, 
and you know he blends all these different kinds of music in it, contemporary music and synthesizers and percussion. But he was, I think, just used Korg synthesizers, and he had a PS thirty one of the first PS thirty three hundreds on that album. It's still a rare beast, and they are prized by those people that have them. Yeah. You know, and again, is it worth the money nowadays, given what things go for? Well, I don't know. I, th I think that just depends on what something means to you. Is it is it because someone's a collector, or is it because somebody wants to really just discover the algorithm and the relationship of any instrument? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean. So I mean, that's I think that's a, co a conceptual idea in itself with, you know, whether something's worth that much money. Moving beyond the time of the intrinsic value of something to get the job done, like a screwdriver or a hammer, to being like, this is George Washington's screwdriver or right. Jimi Hendrix's hammer, <laughs> right? or even just one like Jimi Hendrix's hammer or guitar is very valuable uh, in retrospect. Some of that old technology is still valid, like the TB303 type sequencing mm -hmm. or, or things like the Moog sequencer, which many people have made a career out of learning. It actually became a kind of music for people like Tangerine Dream that couldn't really play like a jazz musician, but they could operate that sequencer to its utmost. And they created music that, wow, how did you get eight sequences out of that one thing? Exactly. They, they figured out how to do it. I love that. Yeah. As soon as I started being able to have multi sequencers, once I had the ARP sequencer, again, this is for your viewers, end of the 80s, early 90s. I bought a Oberheim DS2 mm -hmm. digital sequencer. Yeah. So I thought, oh man, this is this is great. Three buttons, three sequencers, right? Yeah, yeah. and just mm -hmm. a different way too, just to be able to have another different kind of sequencer, different texture, different. It triggered the synthesizer differently. And we mentioned it when Steve Picaro was here. It's literally the first time I knew a real time entry. You can go bum. Yeah, and it will spit back just mm -hmm. what you did because it's not the lockstep kind of rope exactly. Sequence. Yeah, I loved it. You know, it was just like having another tape recorder that would control the synthesizer. Mm -hmm. So I loved it. It was a fickle beast, but you know, and I eventually, you know, couldn't wait to get rid of it. But. And as limited as things like those are now, they are valuable still, or have gone up because of their history and also because they do something really specific but really well in that way since it's a sequencer it has no sound quality so you might right. as well sequencers are great things to have replicated because you're not going to have to have the same circuitry exactly exactly yeah, yeah. you had a cool show last night downtown here in los angeles but you were playing basically in an outdoors warehouse <laughs> downtown la which is a <laughs> a newly hip kind of gentrified district but I'd been around there before, but what was cool about your performance was they had a big DJ type PA system there and it had lots of subwoofers. And those subwoofers made the building physically shake. Oh yeah. And you were using it as yeah. you played. I was having fun with that audience. There's a bit of aluminum siding on this building. It looks like an old industrial warehouse. So <laughs> not only were we feeling the shake go on, but you were tuning bass notes and then sweeping filters around. And I could hear you. Okay, that makes the roof rattle. Now the wall's changing. Oh, yeah, I was looking around <laughs> to see, you know, where I wanted to sort of resonate, see how many clusters of people were over here or there. And I was just, you know, using the 2600 to just, you know, it's got such a great resonant filter. And depending on how you mix it, you know, the yeah. output of it, you know, I make sure I have lots of headroom on the desk okay. so I can, you know, get Boost. it way down there and just crank the output and it's just shakes everybody's this is something that could never be captured like on your records or most people's youtube video performances we have but in concert it was massively a physical experience and it must go back to where we had pipe organs with the 32 foot pedals exactly and it made people feel god in their small space it was like you really can do something live that cannot be captured on a record yeah virgil fox was mm -hmm. someone that really inspired me to think about that you know, that really was one of the first, like, the way that he was presenting Bach to a young audience with the lights and the smoke and everything and and using PAs to that 
to that sort of psychoacoustic effect. It's cool you mentioned it. I have a poster of Virgil Fox in my kitchen. And uh, it's one of those vintage ones where it says, with revelation lights. He used one of those psychedelic light companies that used to tour with Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane and stuff okay. to do his concerts. He brought his own light show as was well. Revelation? Yeah, yeah, Revelation okay. Lights was the name of that group. But as you're mentioning, we've now learned that, especially when you're doing a more electronic performance, be it DJs or synth live, mm -hmm. Bringing the light show, bringing some kind of experiential thing, since you don't have a crazy drummer all the time to look at, or right. or Jimi Hendrix running around the stage, you know, you're bringing something additional to it. Plus, this massive sound you can make with those big bass notes and stuff is also yeah. fun. It's kind of like being the Motorhead of synthesis, right? It, if you can yeah. like hit people hard. <laughs> right, that's it. I'm um, speaking of which. What's the loudest concert you ever went to? Merciful Fate. Oh wow. King Diamond. It was so loud. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. I was in the front row. And <laughs> it was it was an amazing concert, but it was so loud. I mean, my ears rang for three or four days after. There's a group called The Swans I saw. Mm -hmm. Incredibly crushing. Skinny Puppy. Cheap Trick, probably the loudest band I've ever wow. seen. Back in 1980, I think it was. Unbelievable loud. Motorhead was famous for it. As I mentioned, you being the motorhead of synthesis because they used to not play if it wasn't loud enough. If the PA oh, wow. wasn't big enough, they would walk out and say, we're not doing a show because we can't hit the room that hard. We need to do that. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that's the <laughs> that's part of the gig. You know, I mean, that's part of the experience that people are coming and paying their hard-earned dollars to come and enjoy, you know. It, it sets up a mood, too. I was there enjoying the night out, some fresh air, but also people I don't know in the crowd and... Some people on pillows, some people in back, some people standing and dancing. It's really a cool experience, you know? Yeah, I was really grateful. Uh, Behind the Sky Records have been really supportive of my music and just very inspired by what I do because I don't really, I don't do dance music. Yeah. You know, I don't, I really don't want to do that. Um, and I don't use a computer. I don't save sequences. I do mm. everything from the ground up every show. And... For better or worse. There's risk involved in that, for oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Right? It was risky that night because I was right behind all those subs, and the sound company didn't really, weren't really on cue with the monitors for, for each you artist. you to hear what you're doing, yeah. No. So right. I just sort of, at, at sound check, I just went like, I knew I was going to have some trouble with that, you know, lower mid thing, so I just sort of took notes of my range and just thought, well, it's going to be uncomfortable for me for part of these things, but yeah. it's going to be okay. This is the part of performing that, that those who have not done it that much, and I'm less experienced than most people, but it's very different than when you're playing guitar at home or practicing your drums oh, with yeah. an electronic pad set, and suddenly you're in a, a place where you can't hear yourself or the person you're supposed to cue off who's starting the song. It's really tricky. This is it why. is. But with my kind of music, or at least my music, I feel I have control over it because I'm not relying on beats the whole time or yeah. just, you know, certain motifs necessarily. I can give it a break and re keep rebuilding and keep sort of trying to weave a new web with each musical moment in a set. At least I try, you know. But I think you're bold, and I like the boldness of it to say things may not go perfect tonight. They in might fact, not. Likely, there'll be some points you wish were better, but there's always that freshness that's keeping you, and ideally the audience, knowing this is not canned performance, that to do a performance that is being created at that moment, maybe based on some regular things you like to do, some sure. pieces, but then also I'm going to wing it here. I'm going to stretch it out a bit, go a bit longer or shorter. It's fun. It is. It's what makes me want to go back to the studio and and continue to be a student of the art. You know, I think it's so important to go put yourself out in front of a live audience and connect with people and and to get the sort of feedback from an audience that I get some really unique impressions from listeners in live situations, you know. And sure, you're not going to please everybody and it's not always going to be perfect, but I have enough of a control of what I'm doing that I feel I can can create a rotation of ideas and of, and of amplitude and, 
and just continue to try to keep in tune with the room, including the humans that are in it. And something you were saying just reminded me that those of us who grew up more of a unique person, more of a loner type person, maybe, that you spend time developing yourself and finding what you like rather than what everybody else likes to do. Oh yeah, I left. I left society pretty early on and just did session work and hotels and things that really weren't, didn't really make sense to, you know, a lot of people and especially of my age then. But it's what allowed me to really just develop my own ideas and my own feeling about music and about music technology, meaning all of it, you know, synthesizers, recording, how I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And, and I've just kind of never stopped doing that. I'm curious about this time period. You just mentioned hotels because I didn't know about that. And it is a, a kind of a bygone thing, right? Do oh, people... it's, I think it's long gone. Yeah. I mean, it used to be that bars and nightclubs would even hire a band to play on the weekends <laughs> and they would play their ZZ Top or Aerosmith or Skinner right. songs or whatever was popular, the Cars and Blondie in the 80s and so forth. That was probably the end of it. Um, when we got to a period like Nirvana, MTV became original music. We don't want to see covers happen, aside from tribute bands, which I love. But you mentioned your time period. You were playing covers mostly in hotels? Yeah, we did things like you would go to a, ho a hotel and have like a residency for a week or two weeks, and you would go and do like a four to seven dinner set, mm -hmm. you know, yesterday and this masquerade and quiet music. Yeah. And then you go back to your room for a minute, you know, fluff the hair out and go play rock and pop music from 10 to 2. Mm -hmm. And then all day long, I would be practicing. I would either just have a Fender Rhodes in my hotel and just be practicing, or I would, if I had a two week residency at these hotels, I would bring an ARP and a tape recorder up and some headphones. And cool get to track some things. Just do stuff. Now, what do you learn from those times? I grew up in those times where we had a band that played covers. We didn't play out much, but we rehearsed a lot. But it really taught me some things that I wouldn't have known. Did you learn things by doing other people's music that you Oh, used? absolutely. You yeah. learned a lot about harmony and and the way people use certain chord voicings and phrasing, timing, tempo, tempo changes, key changes, and modulation, and there's something to learn from every music. You know, I played everything from R&B and funk to contemporary country music to pop and rock mm. and heavy metal and all of it. I mean, there's something to learn from all of music, you know, and whether it's my personal taste or not is, you know, that's kind of irrelevant. For sure. It's just about letting down the ego long enough to maybe get a different idea about music for a minute. Some people run into those jobs and it was a bit more of a grind. And some people I know lost interest in music being forced to kind of play music they didn't love. Or church music, some people did that a lot. Yeah. Did it have any negative effect on you? Absolutely. You oh. Absolutely. Oh. You know, I mean, you would get on a really good personal musical um, momentum on something, composing a piece of music, practicing a certain thing, or recording something, and then I'd have to stop and go on the road. And, and you know, yeah, I don't want to play certain songs at all or over and over, so yeah. But it provided me with that freedom to have the time off to really study my craft and not just have to do a nine to five and have my few little hours burn out at the end of the night from a day job. Yeah. So I just sort of tried to keep a level head about it and not get into drugs and alcohol and all that other stuff. Just try to really devote my time to music and just tough it out. But yeah, I got burnt out on it. You bet. Besides my buddy Darren here who's working our cameras, who have you met in music because of these experiences that you really enjoyed? Joe Zawinul. Oh, cool. That was the biggest one for me. I got to hang out with him and his sons back yeah. in the 90s. I met his sons at NAMM. Mm. And you know, it's, it's a long story, but they invited us up to be a guest of the family at the Catalina. Wow. And 
just got to hang out with Joe and and you know he would and he was using a Prophet T8 at the time which was one of my main boards. I think it's a great underrated instrument. It is. And you know his at this time his sons are just like what? You know we we've, we've heard of people like you but we've never really met anybody, you know, yeah. back at that time and and Joe was just a really beautiful cat. Yeah, he was intense and intimidating and all those things, but he was a beautiful mind and a very fearless person, someone that was willing to put everything on the table for, for, for a moment of music. Yeah. And that was something that I really loved about him. And the last night, we were there for a couple of days, and at the end of it, he made me sit in front like right in front of the rig. Wow. And he'd bark at me the whole set. <laughs> you pay attention. You know, he would wow. conduct the band and do things and he would signal, you know, watch my feet, you know, watch me switch these MIDI channels or do this and oh it had an immense impact on me. That's really cool that he had a teacher aspect to him or that you were apprentice sort of in a minimal way. The very he understood that relationship and he wanted to open it up to you. And, and, and teach you some stuff. That's really yeah, cool. Yeah, I mean, it was very brief. It was a very Still. fleeting moment, but I mean, it's one that's lasted me a lifetime. And, you, uh, know? you know, how many people would have paid for that as a master class, and you get to just do it because of who you are and where you came from. It's great. Yeah, just out of a couple of convos with them, you know, just, so this is what I'm trying to do right now. You know. I'd say another one was Alan Holdsworth. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. he's a huge, yeah, him and Joe Zalwin are two of my biggest influences and inspirations oh. and and talk about scary musicians I mean almost even to comprehend what they're doing sometimes is really challenging seeing him in concert many times and talking to him is no one more formidable I I can imagine there's people like Eddie Van Halen you know worshiping him and going I wish yeah. I could understand some of that even you know brought him out to give him a record deal and help try to produce music with him uh, that's the kind of respect you're getting from the yeah. world's probably greatest known guitar player at the time. Yeah, Incredible. oh yeah, and Eddie, we, you know, is another genius Without in question. his own right, you know. But yeah, Alan was great to meet and talk with and, and you know, he was usually just bombarded with all the same dumb questions over and over, but you would find those times where you'd just be hanging out at the bar and he would eventually surface around and you'd be like, hey, be what's up? Yeah, you know, talk about how do you like that Oberheim Matrix, you know, and then he would per perk right up, oh, not a guitar question, great. Good. And he was just really open. I remember his delving into a completely different controller called the Synth Axe. Mm -hmm. Good luck finding one, good luck even working <laughs> one, because it's, as you said, changing your instrument. It's a, it, like a guitar, but it's not like a guitar. It's really not like a guitar in a yeah. lot of ways. I mean, it sure it has a fretboard, yeah, but I mean, really, the way that he would play it—I mean, I still don't really understand it. Um, but I mean, some of the stuff that he did on that thing is it's insane. Yeah, there's absolutely. a piece called "Distance Versus Desire" that is really beautiful. Mm. It's just solo syntax. The guitar has been enduring and so popular. There have been Roland guitars, 360 <coughs> systems, uh, uh, any number of ideas where people tried to make a guitar talk with a synthesizer voice, and it's really always kind of failed. Yeah. Like, I, I dream of if I could just play that naturally and get the other sounds, but it never really quite works that way. It's pretty rare. Yeah. I was a huge fan of um, Al DiMiola's Soaring Through a Dream album, which is, is a really Roland era beautiful synthesizer? album. No, it's a Synclavier. Synclav, okay and with the GR controller. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great album because he's just, again, just putting things in there that in one way just don't make any sense, but it's beautiful. And mm -hmm. he's getting those bends and mm -hmm. things that you don't really hear on other analog style um, guitar synthesizers. Mm -hmm. and he does some trumpet and some like Erto's bells and things, and Erto's voice. Yeah. And it's and it's over an acoustic jazz setting, so it's real open and wide, and there's all this space that he specifically created for this thing. Nice. You know, and he's taken 
you know, a lot of solos with it, and it's, it's fun. It's a beautiful album. There's still the limitation that a guitarist plays uncleanly, unnaturally. And a pick noise, it tries to interpret very quickly that that's a note. No. So you have to wait a bit. But if you wait a bit, you have lag. Right. And you're missing things. And if I go chick chick chord, it doesn't know what the chick chick is supposed to be. Right. I'm used to making noises on my guitar. Um, every kind of thing can be distraction to a an interpretive pickup and those things like that. So I think that we may never get there. Those of us who play both instruments kind of feel like there's a chasm still in the middle. I've never played anything that really is accurate. I have a an Ibanez Casio MG510. I have I two. Like them. Uh, I have two they're of cool. them. <laughs> and they're great guitars. They're very expressive. Very. Mm -hmm. um, they're just very accurate guitars. You can play lots of different styles of music on it. And it's a MIDI controller. It's not really, I wouldn't even call it a synth guitar, but it can do a lot of things, but it does not capture the sort of nonce or melisma of a seasoned player, you know? I, I had a chat once with Reeves Gabrels, who is the guitarist who worked with Bowie, Tin yeah. Machine, and other things, and he's a very creative guitar player. Mm -hmm. He likes wildness, and he told me that he was using the Roland Virtual Guitars VG synthesizer system. He said, but I found the secret, and I don't know if this is a completely true, but it seems sensible. Don't treat it like a synthesizer. Treat it like a guitar. If you just took a guitar pickup direct into a board, it's kind of boring. Take the output of the Roland Virtual Guitar, whether it be horns or percussive or whatever, plug that into your pedal board, add distortion, add the wah-wah, then run it into the tube amp and mic it up. And he said, you'll start to hear an instrument that is not just a synth being played by two notes here or two notes on the guitar. You're getting something that feels a lot more expressive and it actually matches your fingers and your playing much more if you take the output of whatever you're controlling into a guitar system. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And Reeves is brilliant. He is, absolutely. He is brilliant. He is he is amazing to watch live how he will conjure up different sounds and and he can blow he yeah. can he's got some serious fire as well even the last time i saw him all his amps were painted different color and his guitar was painted it was like everything was creative about it there was nothing stock not the sounds nope. not the performance not the chords even it was just pretty cool to see that yeah i love him glad um, you mentioned him well, yeah. So here's one of those questions. Okay. If you had a desert island, but it had power outlets, and you could take two instruments then, that limitation we talked about earlier, what would go? It'd either be a Moog Modular or an ARP 2600, mm -hmm. depending on the day. And I guess a great set of speakers. If I only get two. Two instruments, though. Oh, two instruments. Yeah, let's okay, do that. well, I'll take those two. Yeah. Okay, good. That's it. That's good. That's it. Moog Modular 3P and an ARP 2600. You can do Those a lot of that. Those are my two really dear favorite instruments. I was thinking of something polyphonic, which wouldn't qualify there. Would there be a polyphonic choice then if you wanted to do chords? Well, I'd just fidget around. Okay. You'd make it work. Yeah, I'd make it work. If I'd have two keyboard controllers, though. My 2600 plays... Two notes. Two notes. Yeah. Um, it is a thing where the open-ended nature of a modular system allows you to, really, there are thousands and thousands of combinations. Yes. And if you got bored with it, it's because of your mind being limited. If you think a sequencer is for notes, if you think a filter right. is just for brightness, there's so much more that I'm even still learning from the newer and open-minded people that are showing me different ways to yeah. do things. For example, somebody said, if you're plugging in a modular system, we always put the VCA after the filter because since I've always done that. What if you put it before? It yeah. can overdrive the filter. It can make exactly. the filter behave differently. Yeah, that definitely is something I love to do, especially when you're using pulse width modulation, because then it makes the pulse width modulation even more beautiful Pronounced and dramatic. In, in yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's still things we are not thinking of, you know? There's always something. Every time I sit down and work with these synthesizers, especially the two that I mentioned, Yeah. The Moog 3P and the 2600, I always find something new. That's what keeps me coming back for it. But it is interesting the way you and I and many people resonate towards the physical beast. I love, not just love turning the knobs, it's part of the process. 
Well, I'm a performing artist. Yeah. So part of that is making that selection. You know, I've been a guitarist. I've been a drummer. I've, you know, played piano and Fender Rhodes and Hammond organs and clavinets. And they're so interactive and they're so physically interactive. And with the synthesizer, part of it is part of like the show last night. Part of that is being interactive with your environment. Yeah. And that environment can even just be the muse itself, the music itself that you're wanting to create. And you can't do that with just static, you know, a static instrument or a static format, you know, whether it's a computer or a plug in or something like that. I still want to be able to go in and have physical connect to it. You do a lot of live shows. What's your minimum setup time? Well, it depends. If I'm going to do a full modular concert like last night, it takes about three hours. Yeah. Wow. You know, to set up, to program. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, I guess I could have everything all tucked and all that. I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. That's just part of if that, that's if you want to have me come perform and you want to experience what I can bring to a venue or to an art gallery or something like that, then yeah, it's about three hours to set up and program and prepare and mix and 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 create enough signal path that I can be flexible. I can make mm -hmm. a decision to change and I'm not just locked into just sequences and things like that. So it's also probably familiar to those that have been in bands. When you get a sound check, it's a lot better than when you don't have a sound check. Yes. The more the more time you can spend on that space before the people come in and before the the hecticness goes on. If you can really start carving out your space, learning how the room works. Exactly. Making sure that in your subconscious mind you're good to go. Yeah, exactly. And you also have to think about the difference of, okay, well this sounds great when there's nobody in here. How's it gonna sound when it's packed full of people? Yeah. You know, not every room's reverberant or resonant and how am I gonna handle it if the room's totally dead? Or if it's like last night, it was just you know wild and and it was a warehouse, a metallic warehouse, a metallic Metall warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> so you know you got to watch the high end and and just have control all over, over all those things so that you know there's no there's as little possibility to lose the connection with the listener. On your way out, how long does it take to load out? Unplugging is always easier. Oh, I don't know. It takes. It really doesn't take too long. I have a pretty good system. And when I have, when I'm traveling via vehicle, yeah. I have an assistant that comes with me. Great. And we, we got the show <laughs> on lockdown. You know, we have every a system. That's how it goes. And so it takes couple, maybe a couple hours to get everything done and packed in the van. So when you've got your assistant or somebody can get it for you, uh, it really does make life a whole lot easier. It does. And in, in certain situations, if I'm, Let's say if I'm at a university and I'm teaching in one department and I'm going to yeah. go do a concert later, it's nice to have somebody that you know knows what maybe what your systems are in, in a modular or your rig and can at least get it to the point where when you're in sound check, it's going to be fine. I can go in there and do the fine tuning and make it ready for performance, performance ready. When you travel, do you unpatch all the cables? Does everything unpatch? Oh, yeah, everything. Okay. I start from scratch every night. That's cool. To me, otherwise, it would just be pretty boring. You know, it's not, it's not my art. Yeah, true. We had a great chat, and I really Oh, thank think you, Brian. There's more to come, for yeah. sure. But thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. We're going to do more. Privilege and, and pleasure. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Bye-bye. We did it. Yeah, high five.